Well, let's pray one more time. Lord, we're going to take a moment now to again adjust our hearts, adjust our expectation. Because we're not here simply to be entertained by a man or listen to his opinions or to do our religious duty of some sort or to be a spectator. We're here for one purpose and that is to hear from you and receive from you. So we exercise our faith right now for divinely inspired utterance and the anointing that destroys every yoke of bondage. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. God created the heaven and the earth. He creates nothing without form and void. He creates to be inhabited. Reason is a reference to the empirical process that is science. He's saying very clearly that if you engage in the process of reasoning, rationalizing, deducing, or inducing, you can arrive at the proper conclusions of life, even salvation. Having a big picture, large context understanding of where you came from, where you are, and where you're going is absolutely crucial to fitting these little daily challenges we have into their proper place. What happened 6,000 years ago? God breathed the breath of life, imparted spiritual life to man, and he became a living spirit. Well, hallelujah. New series, Eternity, and of course, I'm always excited. This is the best series I have ever in 35 years preached on. I I always feel that way. And so I'm excited about the new series. I want you to be as well. Uh, We had an introductory message last Sunday. You saw a brief recap. Uh, I'm going to give you a lengthy recap. So open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Somehow I can't resist the compulsion to be sure all of us are on the same page. And I'm quite sure, uh, based on attendance profiles, that a lot of people uh, do not come every Sunday. I mean, add it up. We have 10,000 members. We get 5,000 in attendance on Sunday morning. What are the other five doing? Well, anyway... Just part of our busy life, our busy world, choices to be made. But at any rate, I'm not able to uh, feel good about no review at all for that reason. Because if I dive right into the middle of it, then there's a lot of you that are not going to have the context necessary to appreciate what's taught. So let me say this. Isaiah 118, as we reviewed, God said, come, let us reason together. And he said, if that rational deductive or inductive process is to occur, then it can take you even to the most basic essential of life, salvation. He made your mind that way. The problem most people have with reasoning is they don't start out with enough information or the right information. Now, we are alive in a physical, temporal world. Obviously, we have to take part of our information from the physical arena in which we live. And likewise, we are a spirit being, so we have to take part of that information, the things the Bible reveals to us about that arena of existence, into account as well. And when we use both sources of information or data, We have the basis for our God-created, God-given capability to properly reason to a correct conclusion and make valid decisions. But it takes both sides of the the informational source. In other words, there are a lot of people that don't, eh, they blow off the Bible, and they try to understand the important things about life 
just from the natural physical information, temporal information available to them. They're going to fall far short of what they could experience in this life. And the other side of the coin is also correct. There are those that have so spiritualized their life, it's, you know, the only thing they give any attention to is the Word of God. And they ignore all of the physical circumstance or challenges the enemy may be bringing their way and how they have to deal with it. They're going to fall just as short as well. It takes both sources of data. Then we have the capability through the reasoning process, the empirical process, the process of deducing or inducing will take us to a valid conclusion and we can make good decisions. And nowhere is this more important than it is in understanding, you know, great patches of the Bible, beginning with the creation account. There always has seemed to be a conflict between what science says and what the Bible says, and there is not. If each area is rightly divided, meaning there is false science, the Bible refers to that and says to avoid it. There is also religious tradition or the commandment of men which renders the word of God to no effect. So we'd rightly divide the word. We rightly divide the natural information at our disposal. We have the basis for making the kinds of decisions to produce the life you want to have that I want to have. And of course, as the creation account goes, it's part of the big picture that needs to be in place in your mind and in your heart. If there are always these little conflicts, well, the science says it's billions of years old. God says creation was 6,000. Science says we evolved by random chance from a goo ball to the zoo to you, you know? You know, uh, God says, in a flash of time, he created man in his image and likeness. Science and the Bible seem so at odds on so many occasions, shouldn't be. Because if each is rightly divided, they simply corroborate the other. And so that process is what we endeavored to initiate last Sunday. You know, most of that I'm not going to be able to review. Uh, but this is the basis on which we begin our eternity series. And in verse 1 of Genesis 1, we read, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, when is that? Well, science is pretty well established through, you know, accepted methods of scientific endeavor and carbon dating and such, such things that the universal creation is 15 billion years ago or more. And essentially, uh, you know, nobody can pinpoint it, but that doesn't contradict the Bible. So we're just going to start by saying in the dateless past, God created. He created on a universal scale. You know, uh, science says that it all began in a flash in a moment of time, or most agree that that's the case. That doesn't conflict with the word either. God said, let there be light. I believe that momentary flash of creation. It's never stopped. God never said, stop the light. So let there be light. His presence is synonymous with light. Begin flashing across the void of infinity, bringing creation into exist. He never said, stop. And science has determined that the theory of the expanding universe is really not theoretical. It is a fact because basic Methods of spectral analysis and observation have confirmed that to be true. There are quadrants of the universe that are still moving away from us right now at a rate approaching the speed of light. The universe is, is phenomenally large. It has no boundaries that we know of. The bigger our telescopes become, the more nebula or uh, galaxies we're, we're able to discover. And so essentially, God said, says here that in the dateless past, Creation began, and the centerpiece of that creation, the centerpieces, I guess I could say, were the heaven and the earth. One place a habitation for God, another place to be the habitation for his spiritually alive man, made in his image and likeness. 
And so essentially we see other passages in Isaiah 45, 18. He says he creates nothing without form or void. He creates to be inhabited. And yet verse 2, if you read it in the traditional sense, in the beginning God created, and it sounds like he created something without form and void. But if you were to do a word study, you'd find that the word was, where it says the earth was without form and void. The Hebrew word haya, 500, over 500 times in the Old Testament is translated became or becamest. That's the proper understanding. The earth became without form and void. God creates nothing without form or void. He creates to be inhabited. So in the dateless past, when God created the universe, the heaven and the earth being the centerpieces, we can assume the earth was inhabited at that point in time. But then something catastrophic occurred that eliminated all life on earth that brought it to the condition of being without form or void. And now the process of recreation begins, which is what we have in the six days of creation. It's really the six days of recreation. Because the earth was created in the dateless past, inhabited in the dateless past. That's why God said to Adam, replenish the earth because it had previously been occupied. The only thing that we can date back to 6,000 years ago is that God made man from the dust of the earth. He had to make a, make a man. Their all life had been eradicated. But this time, he breathed the breath of life into him and man became a living spirit. He became a spirit being. In the beginning, when God created the earth and it was inhabited. We know from the fossil record that there were beings that looked like us, at least, you know, largely like us, walked up right on two feet, had big brains, bigger brains than all the rest of the animal life. They didn't live by instinct alone. They could reason. They built communities and eventually cities. And all of this is in the fossil record long prior to 6,000 years ago. We may call them Neanderthal, Cro-Mangan. We may have other names for them. But it was a being looks similar to us, walked uprightly on two feet. One big difference, he wasn't a spirit. Man became a living spirit when God made Adam in his image and likeness. That's what makes a man in the image and likeness of God, spiritually alive unto him. And in the original dateless past creation, that wasn't the case. And so all life was eradicated by a catastrophic event that we saw related to Lucifer's rebellion, his defeat, and the casting back into the earth of Lucifer and one third of the angelic host that had rebelled with him. It had such a cataclysmic effect on the earth. And we went through chapter and verse on this in the Word. If you weren't here last week, you do need to get it. And we saw that everything was broken down. All of the cities, all life, even the birds of the skies or heavens fled. And there was no man to be found. Never has that happened before in Bible history. And it's not prophesied to happen in the future because this happened in the dateless past. Okay, that was a lot more review than I had wanted to give. But if we're all on the, on the basic same page, the process of recreation begins in verse 2. We call it six days of recreation. But remember, we're talking God here. He's eternal. He's timeless. I highly doubt these are 24-hour days as we define them in earthly existence. Throughout the Word, we see a day often representing a year. Sometimes a day is seven years. And in Peter, we're told, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as a day. The point being, God being eternal and timeless, it's highly unlikely that there are six 24-hour days in which creation, recreation occurred. It's quite likely it took a much larger span of time, but not identified. The final act of creation was the forming of man from the dust of the earth. Everything had previously 
been eradicated. Four men of the dust of the earth, this time he breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living spirit. He was made then in the image and likeness of God. That happened 6,000 years ago. Now you can't talk about creation or the creation account without spending some time on angels because they're very much a part of it. We are all familiar for the most part or probably with the six dis or seven dispensations of man because that's what the Bible deals with. The seven dispensations of man beginning with the age of innocence, then the age of conscience, the age of uh, civil government, the age of promise, the age of the law, dispensation of the law, the dispensation of grace, and then following, that's where we are now, at the end of this dispensation will be uh, one of divine government. We know those seven dispensations of man, but there was a dispensation that preceded the seven dispensations of man, referred to as the angelic dispensation. It had its beginning prior to the creation of the universe. And it runs all the way up to verse 2. When the Holy Spirit moves on the face of the waters and the recreation occurs, the first dispensation of man begins with Adam in the garden and runs through, uh, again, you know, the millennial reign of our Lord. So angelic dispensation from before the universal creation up to the recreation in the garden. And of course, uh, you know, I think maybe the best way to, uh, to talk about or begin our discussion of angels is to look at a few selected passages to set a framework in place. In the interest of time, I may not turn to them all. They'll probably flash on the screen for your benefit. Uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 18, and I'm not going to turn there does make it clear that God created the angels. And most people don't have a problem agreeing with that. I mean, it says that by him and for him were all things created, including thrones and dominions and powers and principalities. So the angels were created by God. There is one perspective of thought that uh, a, a few people embrace that says, before the universe was created, there existed a spirit realm already inhabited by, you know, all kinds of spiritual beings. God became dominant and, and then, you know, things began to unfold. Not so. God created everything, including the angelic host. And then we uh, only have two questions remaining, really. When did he do it? And for what purpose? Because God does nothing without purpose. So the first would be, when did he create the angels? And we can see that in Job chapter 38. If you want to look there real quickly. Uh, we will read that one. Verse 4, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who laid the measures thereof? If thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now morning stars and sons of God are terms that are used throughout the Old Testament in particular, but uh, a time or two in the New as well, that refer to the angelic host. And so we see that they were already there when universal creation began. So God created the angels First, then the universal creation occurred. The next question is, why did he create angels? And the simple, succinct answer is to provide oversight and rulership for the newly created universe. God is a God of order. Chaos is not part of his doing in any form or fashion. And so he had established an order of authority within an angelic host for the purpose of oversight and rulership of the new universal creation he brought into existence. You know, you can clearly see that in Ezekiel 28. I see some blank looks, so we might as well turn there for a moment. Ezekiel 28. 
We were here for a while last Sunday. I'm going to refer to a couple of points briefly again, but Ezekiel 28, 13. Lord speaking to Lucifer, even though he starts out speaking to the king of Tyrus, a man, you know, he's speaking to the spirit behind that man when Ezekiel prophesies, and that spirit happened to be Lucifer, and he makes this commentary to him. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was I covering, the sardius, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in, the di- in thee in the day that thou was created. Now he's in the Garden of Eden. Now we think, well, you know, where's Adam? Not here. Not yet. As a matter of fact, you know, Adam sure, surely had no tab- tabrets and pipes prepared in him. So we see who he's talking to in verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways in the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So the why is rulership and oversight. And we see Lucifer being established with his headquarters on earth in the Garden of Eden. The word covereth is defined as ruling, uh, overseeing, governmental type behavior and activity. And that's why he was put there. And he remained there until sin was found in him. And so I've seen some commentaries that say the three archangels, Lucifer, Michael, and Gabriel, were each given a third Uh, of the universal creation to oversee Lucifer's happened to include the planet earth and that's what he selected for his headquarters I don't think that matters Uh, you know uh, some others would say that he was given responsibility for all of creation earth was his headquarters doesn't seem to make a lot of difference that was the reason the angels were put in place and there were orders of angels the archangels were the highest uh, of all of the angelic host And of course, Lucifer uh, had also the responsibility, uh, it is often said because of the reference to tabrets and pipes, uh, to lead the the worship and praise of the Lord in the heavenlies. Uh, uh, Michael was called the warring angel. Gabriel, the angel that stands before God, meaning he was his primary source of uh, delivering messages to humanity as needed. Uh, But at any rate, there were the three archangels, the highest order of angel. We see cherubim, seraphim, and common angels referred to. Uh, And so we understand then that God is a God of order. They all have their place in God's scheme of things to oversee the universal creation. And then... You know, because Lucifer, iniquity was found in him, his heart got lifted up. Isaiah twelve fourteen says he made an effort to ascend to the throne of God, of course, was defeated, cast back into the earth with a cataclysmic effect, and destroyed the earth that then was. So war ensued in heaven. We see a little more about this in Revelation twelve seven. You can look there if you'd like. Revelation twelve. Verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So Lucifer has now had a name change, which deceiveth the whole world. Well, that was the world that then was. In our time, he's never deceived the whole world. I mean, there's been a remnant of believers or covenant people of God since Abraham. So he has not deceived this whole world. Uh, But in the world that then was, the deception was complete. And he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him with the the effect that we read about last Sunday and other places in the Word. So then, 
Let's talk about some angel facts for just a moment. Angels are spirit beings with spirit bodies. They do have a body, but it's a spiritual body that is described as a, uh, you know, a capacity beyond anything we could imagine by virtue of our own human capability, the capability of the human body. Uh, their bodies are capable of moving through vast regions of space and time at a rate exceeding the speed of light. And, of course, uh, the Word tells us they excel in strength. One angel, for instance, in one night slew 80,000 or 180,000 Syrians. I forget which. Uh, you can look it up if you're interested in numbers. But it was a lot. And it took one angel only one night to accomplish that, that matter. They can do great things uh, in terms of what our own human physical capabilities are. Uh, they can also, even though uh, they are usually, by virtue of living in the spirit realm, not visible or uh, detectable by human sensory perception. But they do have the ability to manifest themselves to us in this natural arena because we see it occur throughout the Word. Normally, uh, you know, we don't see into that realm unless there's an operation of the gift of the Spirit called discerning of spirits. Some people's eyes get open to it. But otherwise, unless an angel chooses to manifest himself to us, we won't see him. You know, I've had people periodically tell me They've seen angels in here, seen somebody saw my guardian angel at one point. Um, you know, so, uh, but they, they allow that. And of course, uh, we're told in Hebrews 13 too, uh, that if you entertain strangers, uh, you know, some have done so unaware that they were entertaining an angel. It isn't a facetious manifestation. They do so for a purpose. They're messengers of God. And there are occasions apparently when, uh, you know, they need to be manifest to the person they're delivering the message to. But these are things we see in Scripture. Now, if you're here this morning, and all of this sounds like kind of a fantasy type deal, you're going to have to decide whether or not you believe this. That's right. Because this is all very much the Word of God. And the Bible says that you are to receive the whole counsel of God. You don't pick and choose what you want to receive, big guy. You just don't. Oh, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. But all this other stuff, I don't know. You know, tongues and catching the way of the church. No, I don't know about that. Yeah. No, the Bible basically says to receive the whole counsel of God. You can't pick and choose what you want because you become the creator. You are creating a God that does not exist but is acceptable to you in your mind to serve. Not a God that exists. You're not, you're not opening your heart to the kind of precept that will change your life. So accept the whole counsel. That was for somebody. Because basically, what I'm sharing with you about angels is not privately held opinion. It is the Word of God. And there's chapter and verse for all of this. And so essentially... Uh, more angel facts then. They will occasionally manifest themselves uh, to us in this arena for purposes of carrying out their, um, you know, their message or whatever it is uh, they do. But they cannot interfere with human choice or human decision in an invasive way. And this is true for Good angels or bad angels? All of the things I'm talking about now apply to both good and bad. They're all angels. But God draws the line at the manipulation of human free moral agency because he won't allow that. He said he's placed before you life and death, blessing and cursing. He wants you to choose life. But he makes it clear the choice is yours. He doesn't impose anything on you. He doesn't make you get saved. Unfortunately, he doesn't make you tithe. You know, it is a fact that he, he restricts his operation in the earth 
to the cooperation of free moral agency, our free moral agency. And so he's not going to allow the enemy of your soul to impose himself on you either because he created angels not for that purpose. And so their intrusion into human affairs isn't going to happen. Messenger angels, uh, certainly they occur throughout Scripture. In our dispensation, we have the Holy Spirit, so not nearly so much. But yes, um, you know, to deliver messages, and Satan can operate on that same general level. He can deliver his messages too. But now his messages are corrupted by his desire to undermine the plan of God. Understand if God has limited himself to our free moral agency, he works through that free moral agency to bring about his plan for mankind for the eternal ages to come. Satan and his fallen demonic host or his fallen host understand what their destiny is, is going to be. The lake of fire. And so the only way he can undermine the unfolding of God's plan is to interfere with human free moral agency. He can't inject himself into human affairs, so he has to persuade. He brings messages that aren't correct. The Bible says that, you know, all we've got to stand against are the wiles of the devil. A reference to his deceptive arena of operation. I have said it before, I will say it again. If the devil can't deceive you, he can't defeat you. He's got to get you believing something else. Because you're going to act on what you believe. The Bible says, ultimately, a man is as he thinketh in his heart. And Jesus said, it's going to be unto you according to your faith. Faith is nothing more than investing your belief system in the Bible. That's what faith is. And if the Lord said, your life is going to be unto you according to your faith, not according to the, uh, the favor of your boss or your, uh, the business opportunity that arose, or not according to how smart, how cool, how persuasive you may be. It's not according to the color of your skin, to the parents you were born to. It's not according to anything but your faith. That is where your destiny unfolds. And Satan knows that's the case. So if he wants to change your destiny in order to interfere with the unfolding plan of God, he has to change what you believe. And so he works on you through contrary circumstance. Bible says he's the God of this world for the balance of this dispensation. Since Adam bowed his knee to him in obedience, he has the legal spiritual right to manipulate circumstance and unwitting people that don't know better to produce the kind of contradictions to the word of God that would alter what you believe. And that's why God says, don't be moved by what you see. What happens to anybody else? How long it takes for the grace of God to show up in your own life. You just be committed to the word of God. And so, you know, the enemy works to undermine this by bringing pressure against your belief system. Well, I've been up there three or four times, and I haven't gotten a healing yet. I don't know if that stuff is, is meaningful or not. Well, there's going to be a little something coming whispered in your ear. That's not true. It's not the will of God to heal you. Well, I've tithed for six months. No wonders of heaven have opened for me. Well, you need to quit tithing, dummy. Why are you doing it? I mean, we're, this is the battle. Are you here this morning? Because he can't defeat you if he can't deceive you. So that arena of operation is the limit for angels, good or bad. Messenger delivery. Realizing some of the messages are going to be God's messages. Some of them are going to be 
Satan's messages. And this is how we distinguish between the two. But at any rate, that means then that angels cannot possess a human being. So possession of a person by a member of the fallen angelic host is wrong doctrine. They have a spirit body already. They can't just somehow lay down their spirit body and and let it take a rest in the corner while they go possess a human body. So possession by fallen angels is not a correct understanding of Scripture. Possession is a fact, but it's demonic possession. Well, you mean demons aren't fallen angels? Well, that's my proposition, my opinion, and it's shared by many, many scholars and and people that have studied this for a long time, but it is an opinion because there's a chapter and verse for this. But then, you know, if possession is going to be possible, it has to be by a disembodied spirit. Because something's already got a body, obviously can't, can't make that move. And angels do have that kind of body. And so essentially, uh, where do demon spirits come from? Well, you remember in the world that was before Lucifer's rebellion, there were communities and cities of men. They simply weren't spiritually alive. They, were, they had a soul, but they had no spirit per se. They were, you know, uh, an improvement on animal life, which for the most part operated by instinct. They had the ability to reason, to think, to feel. But when everything was wiped out, they became disembodied. There was no place to go. I mean, he had deceived them completely. He's referred to as rulers of devils and demons in the word. So he's their boss because he had deceived them in the world that then was. The whole world was deceived by him. So they're still under his authority, but they're not in hell. Hell's not going to be occupied until the end of this age, until the beginning of the millennial reign. And then Satan and his rebellious host, or even then at the end of the millennium, going to be loosed for a short while to deceive whom else they may, and then consign to everlasting fire at the great white throne judgment. That's the way the word reads. So hell's not in use right now. Part of it is, I'll touch on that momentarily, uh, but for the most part it is not. And that's why Satan is called the prince of the powers of the air. They are in the atmosphere, in the air, surrounding this temporal creation. They're spirit beings, so we can't see them without the operation of the gift called discerning of spirits, which isn't very usual. And the Lord only does it for a specific reason in your life. If you need to see something, he does not do it very often. So, you know, every now and then you bump into somebody walking around. I'm seeing in the spirit. No, you dope. Get back in your seat. You're not, you're imagining things. So discerning of spirits does not happen often. And not for any facetious reason or to give you something to play with. It is if there is a desperate need for you to have knowledge you would not have any other way. So they're in that realm. Prince of the powers of the air around us. Seeking whom they may devour. They're not consigned to hell at this point. Well, um, so demonic possession is real, but you need to know what demons are. They're disembodied spirits from the world that then was. The only way they can find expression is to inhabit a body that, that lives, is alive in this temporal arena. Their first choice obviously would be a human being, uh, but they can also possess animals. You know, and I've known people that had possessed cats, you know, but that's another subject altogether. But we know the Bible says, (laughs) 
I never met a dog that was possessed, but I've known a few cats that were possessed. I'm just, you know, uh, being humorous, hopefully. But anyway, um, we see that example in the Word when Jesus cast a legion of devils out of the maniac of Gadara. He cast them into a passing herd of swine. And it drove them so nuts it went right off the edge of the cliff. And here we have our first case of deviled ham. <laughs> Come on, y'all. You can get a little more vocal than you're big. I won't resort to corny jokes if you'll get with me here. But at any rate, uh, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, possession cannot happen with you. Because you've been made a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're inhabited by God himself and the enemy of your soul. There isn't any demon that can uh, cohabitate your temple along with God. You are already spoken for. Amen. But there can be the experience of demonic oppression. Problems in your physical body can occur from demonic activity or Waves of oppression or darkness or heaviness are often uh, relatable to their behavior in your life. But it really, does. you just need to know who the enemy is. Because you've already been given the victory, you need to know where to point your gun. I mean, if you're shooting your gun over here, when you should have been shooting it over here, then, you know, you might have a little bit of a problem. That's why we go through this stuff. And so essentially, you know, uh, if you, I, you've got the Holy Ghost, I believe you'll know if there's demonic activity of that sort, you bind it, take authority over it, plead the blood over your life, tell him to get out. And he's got no choice but to obey. You simply have to identify, believe the word is a revelation of truth, and engage in the process. But at any rate, back to the original point of discussion, angels cannot intervene, interfere, override God's plan for man. And there's a serious consequence if they do. We actually see that in Jude chapter 1 verse 6 if you want to turn there. Jude is a little one page book right before Revelation. So turn a few pages to the left. In verse 6 it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So they are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So even though most of the fallen angelic host and virtually all of the demonic activity is to be found today, in the atmosphere around us. Haven't been consigned to hell yet. There are some that have been. And the reason this given is because they left their first estate. Left their own habitation. Means created purpose. And the Lord won't allow it. What was that created purpose? Look at Genesis chapter 6. Happened pretty close on. To the creation of Adam. Well, I know I've got a Genesis 6. Verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. So we see it was close on, uh, you know, to the creative account, recreation, account of recreation. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Now get this. There's a crossover between two different orders of being. An intervention in the affairs of men that the Lord would not allow. Satan's um, effort was obvious and transparent. He had been just prophesied to that his head was going to get crushed by a particular seed that emanated from Eve. And he is making an effort to corrupt and corrode the seed that would produce the Messiah that would crush his head by having 
part of his angelic host cohabitate with the daughters of men. And God wouldn't allow it. They're leaving their habitation, their first estate, their created purpose, lines of creation that should never be crossed were getting crossed between the spirit and the natural arena. And uh, so that's what it means when it says they left their first estate. And so that's why, again, we see in Second Peter chapter 2, you can look there right quick. Verse 4, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, now this brings up another subject. How much time you got this morning? You don't want to watch the ball game, do you? You don't want to watch the ball game. Keep going. No, I want to watch the ball game, so it's not going to go too long. But if, if God spared not the angels that sinned, well, we know he's not talking about the rebellious angelic host. Um, you know, he's prepared uh, the hell for them. But it says, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Well, yeah, that's this bunch. Well, the word for hell here is not the word usually used. The Greek word is Tartarus, and it's generally described by most commentaries that I've read as a compartment of hell now that uh, these angels that left their first habitation have been chained in. But God clearly made a point to the fallen angels. They have recourse, legal recourse, uh, to exercise some measure of dominion in this earth by virtue of Adam's having bowed his knee to Satan in obedience. Their consignment to hell will not be until the end of this dispensation. So, but he's made a point to them. He will not allow a transgression of their created purpose so as to interfere with the free moral agency of man to make choices for life and blessing. And that's what ultimately this robbed. He won't allow it. So then, the only thing that uh, an angel can do, a dark angel can do in your life, is work to influence you in a way that uh, would detour you from the will of God. The last thing that remains is how do we relate to them in a practical sense? Good angels and bad. How do we relate to them? How do we interact with them in our lives as Christians? And this is going to be very short because I have already um, exceeded my self-imposed time limitation by a few minutes. Uh, but good angels first. You know, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, I believe it is. Yeah, uh, verse 16 and 17, you know, the Lord tells us they're sent to be ministers to the heirs of salvation. How many of you are heirs of salvation? Amen. They're to work for you. And he says, therefore, in verse 1 of chapter 2, it's a continuation of the thought. Therefore, because they're sent to be your ministers, give more earnest heed to the things which you have heard lest they should slip from you at any time. Give more earnest heed to what things have we heard. He's talking about what the Word says. That's what brings faith. So he's saying, give more earnest things that the Word, heed to the things that the Word says about angels. In other words, you should be studying about them a little bit. Because in verse 3, he said, how shall we escape? The tribulation, the challenges of this life, if we neglect so great a salvation that is available to us in them. Now, yes, of course, in a general sense, it could be talking about our salvation, being born again, made a part of the kingdom of God. But the context is angelic ministry. So I would suggest he's saying they offer a way of escape. How shall we escape? They offer a way of escape from the challenges we face in this life. And how shall we escape it if we neglect their ministry to us? Therefore, give more earnest heed to what the Word says. Word says a lot of things about them. You should study this out. Many books, CDs about angels you can lay your hands on. But essentially, the primary thing that I want to mention now is the word says that angels only hearken to the voice of God's word. No, they don't hearken to the word that you believe. They don't hearken to the word that you know. 
they hearken to the word that you give voice to. And so being aware of this makes us more efficient users of angelic ministry. They're there for us as heirs of salvation. Excel in strength, have great capacity, but they lie dormant or sit dormant or whatever they do in most believers' lives. Because we're not actively commissioning our angelic ministry in a way that's consistent with the Bible. They're sent to do a lot of different things for us. We see in the Word that their talents are, are many. They're varied. And they excel in great strength. And we put them to work with the words of our mouth. To defend you. On a spiritual plane, you know, they respond to prayer in that manner. Sometimes, you know, there's a little bit of a delay because of the warfare they're engaged in in the spiritual arena, but they're there to fight for you. They respond to your prayer, your direction of the word. They're called harvesters, harvesting not only souls, but the Harvest of any seed that have been sown. But I wonder how many Christians commissioned their angelic hosts to go into the fields of harvest where I have sown and bring in my harvest because God said he would not be mocked. So understanding the use of our ministering angels, how they respond Make it necessary for us to give more earnest heed to the things we've said. And then they can be more productive in our lives. So how do we relate to the dark angels? Ephesians 6.11 says that if we're going to stand in that day against the wiles of the devil. We have to take on the full armor of God. The wiles of the devil... You know is a reference to the fact... Or stand rather is a reference to the fact that we are going to overcome him. It sounds passive, like you're just going to stand there and take a whipping, but you're not going to give up. No. If you have an indices Bible, look up um, Ephesians 6, 12, I think it is. And the word for stand or withstand, and histomy, literally means overcome. The indices, the indices Bible have a center reference column and it'll use the word overcome. You can see what it means. It means to overcome evil in the evil day. Then you're going to have to put on the whole armor of God. Say whole. whole. Not one or two pieces, folks. That's like closing the front door, the side door, but leaving the back door open. Put on the whole armor of God. And you will not just withstand, you'll overcome in the evil day. And that's what the Lord intends for you. And so, you know, that armor is varied. It starts with the belt of truth girding about your loins. You have to have the truth of God's word clearly established in your life if you're going to have a foundation to work from. You know, we're told that a breastplate of righteousness is important. Meaning very simply, you've got to cover your heart out of the heart flow the issues of life with an awareness of your right standing with God. Your heart is open to all kinds of issues and difficulties and trouble if you're not established in who you are in Christ. He's not mad at you. He's not your problem. He's not bringing the hammer of judgment down on your head. Your sin has already been judged at the cross. He sees you as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And we tend to see ourselves a lot of other ways because we know who we were and maybe who we were yesterday. And so we don't feel like we deserve any of these great points of deliverance or blessing. So you've got to have a change. You've got to know who you are in Christ, what he wants for you. Breastplate of righteousness. Your feet have to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Meaning you have to understand that where you go with your life needs to be to get others saved into the kingdom. To expand the influence of the kingdom of God in this earth. 
That has to be your purpose. If your purpose is to put a little resolve on, religious salve on a guilty conscience on Sunday morning, but your purpose is to make some money, buddy, to run that business or to do whatever you're doing, even if it's something good, you're going to have a problem. Your door is open. We all have the same dispensational mandate to use the resource of our life to advance God's purpose in the earth. And that's getting people saved, getting them grown up on the word of God, and expanding the influence of God's kingdom in this earth. You know, if that's not your purpose, if it's about me, ultimately me, me, mine, Oh, God, I need a little help here. Oh, God, heal my body here. Oh, God, I just need a few more bucks to pay day. Oh, Lord, give me another wife. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, you'll be, you know, you'll be living way below the spiritual poverty line, friend, if that's the case. So, you know. Having that awareness is having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of, the, of peace. The shield of hate will quench every fiery dart that the enemy throws your way. Every negative circumstance, every kind of demonic oppression or satanically inspired uh, encroachment upon your life can be quenched. With the shield of faith, grounded, and grounded thoroughly in the Word of God. The helmet of salvation, keeping your thought life right, throwing down, casting down vain imaginations, shaping your image of your future, your vision. You know, drawing that picture of what God has for you on the canvas of your imagination. Building an expectation of His will being realized. Your one offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. Well, it's not a sword according to the Word unless you put it in your mouth. This is how you do damage to the enemy. On God. And then you start speaking. You're a defeated foe, devil. You can't do this to me. You have no right, no place in my life. I plead the blood over you. I command you to flee my life now in Jesus' name. Amen. He's got to respond to that. That's your offensive weapon. Now I used to, I used to, you know, I didn't want anybody to think I was too radical, so I'd say, I'm And then finally I got so fed up and getting whooped around by him, I just said, get out of here! <laughs> but that's your sword of the spirit. Two or three people jumped about three feet when I hollered them. I'm sorry about that. Must have been the devils leaving your shoulder. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. But these, you know, these are things I'm saying to you now simply to stir you up about these truths. It's part of the big picture understanding. If you don't know who your enemy is, where he came from, what he is able legally under God to engage in, what he can do, how he's going to approach your life, how you respond, then how in the world are you going to deal with the little puzzle pieces of your life? So I just want you to take it seriously enough to study these things out for yourself and, and uh, let these words resonate within your heart. That is it for today. Next. Thank you. Next. Next time out of the box is probably going to be evolution. And that's not one I want you to miss because we need, we need that kind of understanding.